Hello again, and welcome to the second of these three videos on system security. Last time, we focused on why system security is so important. In this video, we're going to consider the range of security threats that the modern day network faces. There are six distinct types of threats that we're going to be considering. We'll start by looking at the most commonly known threat, namely malware or malicious code. People often mistakenly call every type of threat a virus, but as you will discover, this is not always the case. There are five main categories of malware that you need to be able to recognize and describe. Now, all malicious code is malware. So what differentiates one from another is how they are delivered to the host device, the code itself, how it behaves, its purpose when it's executed, and finally, the damage it causes. And of course, the motivation of the hacker, the person who wrote the code. We'll go through these one by one, focusing on how the attack is carried out and its purpose to answer the question, what does the attacker get out of it? The second threat is DDoS, a distributed denial of service attack. These types of threats are often carried out on medium or large businesses, and they're complex in nature. They've often made big headlines. The third threat is the SQL injection. This involves gaining unauthorized access to a database to steal data. The fourth threat is the so-called man in the middle attack, which involves the interception or theft of data. This requires a special set of tools and the knowledge to use those tools. We then cover the fifth threat, which are brute force attacks. These center around repeatedly trying to guess someone's username and password through trial and error, but using communications technology. And lastly, the sixth threat is social engineering. That means tricking people into giving you their sensitive data. Now, there's a lot to cover in this topic. However, in reality, you only need to demonstrate the understanding of the key characteristics of each threat. In your revision on malware, focus on the delivery method, the behavior of the code, its purpose, the effect or damage it causes, and the motivation behind the attack. The main reason for students dropping marks in this section is because of a lack of precision. You only need to produce a small amount of information about each attack, but critically, that information has got to be accurate and precise. Once we've completed the next video, you can then add threat prevention methods to this list, and then it's complete. Let's begin with worms. Worms are self-replicating. This means that they create copies of themselves. Unlike viruses, they do not require a host program to survive. This means that they do not need to embed themselves into a program. Worms operate by sending copies of itself to other systems. They damage a computer's health by consuming bandwidth or system resources. What motivates the release of a worm? Well, the Stuxnet worm was believed to be released by a government to inhibit the enrichment of uranium in Iran. The code was incredibly sophisticated. Only targeting organizations which used a specific type of software that controlled the centrifuges required to produce enriched uranium. The code infected the host system and then sped up the centrifuges so that the uranium was unsuitable for manufacturing nuclear weapons. So in this instance, the motivation was political. The slammer worm back in 2003 infected 90% of vulnerable computers within 10 minutes of being released on the internet. It achieved its full scanning range of 55 million scans per second after three minutes. Its DDoS attacks grounded transatlantic flights, closed down the Bank of America's cash point machines and caused over one billion pounds worth of damage. In this case, the motivation was simply to cause problems and chaos. I recommend that you go back and listen to these descriptions at the end and pick out the key words and phrases 
that describe these different types of malware. Then underline these keywords and phrases or create index cards or mind maps or notes from which you can then revise. It would be time well spent. We then come to the malware that everyone's heard of, namely viruses. Crucially, unlike worms, viruses do require a host program. They operate by replicating and embedding themselves into a host program. The malicious code is executed when the host program is executed. Like worms, viruses can cause a range of issues such as corrupting and deleting data. Adware is another type of malware, but this time displays unwanted advertisements. The adware, once executed, will use the user's browser history to target advertisements that are tailored towards the user. It tends to be irritating in nature rather than dangerous because of the frequency of the pop-ups. However, adware has been known to slow computers down and cause them to crash. When we discuss Trojans, what we're really talking about is the delivery method rather than the payload, the virus that is. The unsuspecting user will download a free application from the internet that purports to do something useful or helpful, such as converting files from one format to another, or perhaps removing the DRM tags from music. But when the code's executed, it will install adware or other malicious code on the user's computer. Financial gain is the motivation behind adware. The last area of malware is ransomware. Like adware, it's often delivered via a Trojan or by clicking on a link or email attachment that subsequently executes the code. Again, it is malicious code, but its purpose this time is to lock or encrypt the user's files and then demand payment in order for those files to be unlocked or decrypted. 2013 brought the crypto locker, which spread throughout email attachments and encrypted the user's files so that they couldn't access them. Hackers sent users a decryption key in return for up to £2,000. Many victims who refused to pay up lost all of their files. The moral? Back up your data. The next form of malware is the DDoS attack, a distributed denial of service attack. And it's a complex operation requiring planning. It's designed to bring down a node, a website or a server. There are many variations of this DDoS attack from worms that are released onto the internet and run without any further human intervention, to a variation where the hacker infects hundreds or thousands of computers with malware. The infected computers or smartphones or whatever they are, are known as bots. In the attack, the bots are controlled by a command and control bot known as the bot master. The bot master, which is controlled by the hacker, instructs the bots to attack at a, a given node at a given time. Then, thousands upon hundreds of thousands of bots bombard a given website with data packets. This keeps the system so busy that it can't cope with all the requests for information that it's receiving. This has the impact of preventing authorized users from accessing the website and renders the, the website or the system completely useless. It often causes the system to slow down or to crash altogether. Once the system's crashed, it becomes even more vulnerable to attack. The fourth group is the SQL injection. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. It's the language used to write database queries. A query, by the way, is a kind of command written in SQL, which is basically a question. So if you were searching a music database, for example, you could write an SQL query that searched for all the tracks that were downloaded over 10,000 times from a particular genre, like drum and bass. An SQL injection works like this. The hacker adds an SQL statement to the end of a username or password when they enter it into an input field, which would typically be on a web form. This malicious code is read by the database and permit unauthorized access so that the hacker may steal or destroy sensitive data. Given the ubiquity of databases across every business and industry, SQL injections pose a serious threat. The fourth type of threat is interception or theft. This is also known as the man in the middle attack. A man in the middle attack occurs when a hacker intercepts sensitive information using specialized system and or hardware 
to carry out an activity known as packet sniffing. We already know that data travels around networks in packets, so the hacker accesses the communication path and intercepts key data via a process known as packet sniffing. Again, the motivation is to steal sensitive data with a view to sell the information or use it to threaten or blackmail. The fifth threat is the brute force attack. Brute force attacks occur when a hacker repeatedly tries to log into a system by using different passwords. This is achieved by using an application which is able to generate many thousands of different combinations every minute. And it uses an online dictionary to achieve this. The sixth and final category is social engineering. This category highlights that people are the weak points. Let's deal with shoulder surfing first of all, that's the easy one. Shoulder surfing is the act of somebody watching someone else enter a password. They then remember that password and they use that password to log in masquerading as the other person. They gain unauthorized access to their account with the aim of stealing funds or sensitive information, some kind of financial gain. Phishing, spelt PH of course, is the last threat and the one that you've probably already encountered in some form. Early internet users were confronted with very crude versions of this phishing scam, but nowadays they're far more sophisticated. A phishing scam works like this. A web page that a user encounters appears trustworthy. This tricks the user into entering sensitive information like usernames or passwords or credit card details or bank account numbers. When the user enters these details, the sensitive data is passed via the form to the hacker who is then able to steal the information and use it to gain access to the user's sensitive information or, or data or to delete or corrupt files for financial gain or to gain a competitive advantage, to blackmail, perhaps because they bear a grudge and maybe they're making a stand against a company or an institution or some kind of political statement. Sometimes they do it just because they can. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe if you want to be the first to watch the latest videos on computer science.